Hello and welcome to the How to Exit podcast, where we introduce you to a world of small to medium business acquisitions and mergers. We interview business owners, industry leaders, authors, mentors, and other influencers with the sole intent to share with you what it looks like to buy or sell a business. Let's get rolling. And now a moment for our sponsors. I want to highly recommend you get Acquisition Aficionado Magazine. Every month, Acquisition Aficionado Magazine brings you tactics for business buying and selling you won't find anywhere else. Learn firsthand from industry leaders who share their success stories, featuring in-depth interviews and stories from leading figures in the business acquisition industry. This multi-platform mobile magazine speaks to acquisition entrepreneurs wherever they are in the journey. And I want you to visit acquisitionaficionado.com today. Hello and welcome to the How to Exit podcast. Today we're here with Simone LaRue. And he is the founder, CEO, I guess the head of uh, Optionality, which is a cool AI tool platform we're going to talk about a little bit that's in the mergers and acquisition space. Thank you for being here today. Uh, I know you, there's a million things you could be doing, so thank you for spending your time with us. No worries. My pleasure. Cool. Let's, let's start off with kind of give a background to who you are, and then we'll jump right into what is this tool you guys are creating and who is it for. So um, you have both a, a dual purpose for being on the show today, right? You've got this cool tool you're building for all of us and for the advisors that participate in our guests, but you've also had your exit. You've built something from bootstraps. So uh, let's hear a little bit about kind of your origin story, and then we'll jump into some of the meat of today. Great. Well, listen, uh, thanks for having me, Ron. Uh, my name is Simon. I'm a serial founder. So this is my fourth uh, fourth business. Uh, so I've exited like two. I'm still operating one and just a launch uh, optionality, which is VC backed by Anovia Capital, which is one of the largest VC here in Canada. I'm from Montreal, Canada. So thanks for having me. Background into uh, e-commerce and artificial intelligence. I'm a data guy uh, meeting, uh, you know, uh, MNA basically. Last startup was Gazelle AI, Bootstrap, uh, founded in 2015, two years of R&D with a team spread in the US and Canada. Build a really cool niche product for doing foreign direct investment attraction. So we were basically using artificial intelligence to predict which companies would be expanding internationally. Our platform was being used by economic development agency. So the U.S. Department of Commerce or Enterprise Florida or every like state, city has an economic development agency responsible for attracting business into their jurisdiction to create wealth and jobs. So those were our clients. Uh, scaled that business from, uh, you know, and a very su- successful journey uh, for uh, about five years. And uh, then uh, sold it to KKR, which is a large PE fund last year in 2023. We further integrated one of their portfolio companies. We were an add-on to a platform of KKR, a company called Lightcast.io. So I've you know been through the journey of building, selling a business. And uh, when I sold that business, basically I joined a uh, Inovia, which is like, again, a VC fund as what they call an EIR, which is an entrepreneur in residence. So you basically help the VC make investment into promising and full startups. And at the same time, you have to basically uh, work on your next gig. So I knew when I sold my last business that I wanted to create another one. I still had that inside of me. I thought that I, I, I didn't know yet what I would be working on. I knew it would be an intelligence and artificial, artificial intelligence and involve some kind of data. And what really resonated with me when I was at, uh, you know, during that term at Inovia was the fact that as an entrepreneur, as a founder, multiple times I lived the problem that I wanted, that I wanted to solve, which is basically how much my business is worth, really. Because you get, especially if you're an SMB or lower mid-market, I'm sure it's the same thing for a lot of your audience. You get numbers pissed into your ears, like all the time, sorry for the expression, but like, and, it, and the ranges are, are really, <laughs> really big. So who's right, who's wrong? And because you are a smaller business, you don't necessarily have access to all of the advisors and certainly don't have access to all of the data to make up your mind about how much your business is worth. So that was one question that I was having. The other question I was having is basically, what's the best timing for me to sell my business? So we built Gazelle, my previous company, during the COVID time. So there was a lot of ups and downs and bumps in the roads and like growing pains. 
And I was continuously asking myself, okay, so should we sell now? We get like that new milestone, like we're having momentum or we're having some issues. So what's the best timing for me to sell my business again, based on the market dynamics? And the third thing is like, what should I do basically to maximize my enterprise value? Because when you get like numbers, multiples, whether it's a traditional business and it's like, you know, you can be worth between three times a bit though, or like five times a bit though. Well, I want to get five times a bit though. So what do I need to do to get five times a bit though? If you're rolling a, a startup, like an AI startup, it's like the numbers are like, it's ranges between three times revenue and 20 times revenue. So what do exactly. I need to do to get three times revenue? So those were my questions. I had a hard time answering those questions. So we did our best. We talked to advisors. We run, you know, an iBanker process. We got the company sold. But then I said, what can I do with this knowledge that I've accumulated? And I decided that I would create optionality, which is, you know, this platform that we can talk about. I'm also very happy to answer any questions for your audience about what was my process and what was it like to build a business and sell it to a PE. But like optionality is really designed as a platform to help the business advisors. So exit planners, bankers, accounting firms, iBankers, everybody is involved in helping the business owners getting ready for an exit or not, like just getting business owners to maximize their enterprise value, to do it at scale successfully. And I can talk about that later on this, if you'd like. Yeah, awesome. So you have both experience of bootstrapping and something that I don't have too many people on the show uh, that can talk about, and that's the the route of raising VC capital to fund a deal. Uh, most of the guys on this show either get private lending slash SBA loans slash their own money. Some of them do raise funds, but they don't really go. There's not a VC pull out there currently that I know of. I know a couple of people trying to do some lower market uh, PE type of plays but that will fund the purchase of an existing company, right? Most of these guys are, uh, their model's different, right? And what they're looking for in you is different uh, than somebody who would look to buy an existing up and running cash flowing business. They're willing to go higher risk because they're looking for much greater reward, right? So uh, let's talk about, I think we start with that and then we circle back around. Let's talk about what is the world of, Creating something. Let's do let's do the bootstrap. Let's go to Chrono because so it makes so it makes sense to both of us. Let's let's follow your life path, right? Yeah, we do. We built you built this thing bootstrap. You're going through the you know the growth cycle, the uncertainty of when to sell. Uh, did K is it KKR? Yeah, KKR. Did they reach out to you? Did you reach out to them? Did you come up to? I think this is the window. that's time to sell. Or that like a lot of founders, somebody just reached out to you and said something. You know, okay, I'll listen. So. Well, yeah, I can certainly talk about that. Like, I would start by saying that the the grass is always greener on the other side. What I mean by that is like, if you're a bootstrap guy, you think that, oh, it would be so great to have like VC money and I can do all of these things and go faster and do this and do that. And I was that guy, right? I bootstrap for multiple reasons. Part of it is actually when we, when I started my, my other company, we wanted to raise some VC money. We were not successful, uh, very early stage. Like it, it you know, VCs are good at de-risking business and identifying like, tr like, and part of that is like, we need to get like right market fit and revenue. And when we start like raising for my past company, we were having none of those. So we pass on that, but like, it was a blessing because we were able to actually like really focus on building something solid and getting, learning how to make revenue real, real quick and being profitable as a AI startup that, that, that was not really common back in in the 2015, 2017 like era. So long story short, bootstrap that business, uh, grew it like any entrepreneurs, like growing pains. So you get like to certain hurdles. So we went from like, like our first million of ARR and in, in the tech industry, we talk of, often in terms of AR, like instead of revenue, so you realize recurring revenue, but like literally in six months. So hyper grow then from one to three, three to five, five to seven. Like we were like really, really a, a poster child and certainly in the AI, AI companies uh, here in, in, in Canada with like a presence internationally. So tons of clients in the US, tons of clients in Europe and Asia as well. But that's the, that's a good, like that, that's a good side of the story. 
the bad side of the story, the real things are like all of the growing things, uh, you know, bringing top talents, like pivoting into new markets, like dealing with churn, dealing with security, dealing with like suck to compliance and all of that. And being bootstrapped kind of limits you to make those kind of investments. And we were having competitors like every other business and we were competing against like fairly large players that were VC back. So they, they were having like the 20 million, 30 million, 50 million, hundred million dollar investment. And they were like building products similar to ours. So at some point we were three founders. We thought that we, we took the business to, uh, you know, where we could, you know, uh, bring it. Two of my co-founders were, were a bit older than me. One of them was thinking about retiring. And uh, we just thought that um, it would be a good time for us to actually, we had the discussion about like fundraising at that point. You know, I knew that we needed either the injection of money and basically decide to go at it for another five years. And then you've, you've done it for five years. So you know all the blood, sweat, and tears that went through that process. Or we find like a, a strategic buyer that would like take us and bring us to the next level. So we, st we decided to go that route. So we started a process. We hired an iBanker, we went through all of that journey, we got multiple LOIs and the way that we found actually our, our current buy, like the buyer of the company was actually like a data partners of ours, which is a big thing about like about what I believe on how to exit the best, it's to build that optionality years in advance and build those partnerships and relationships. So we had like a sponsor that was basically helping us and brought us to, you know, KKR and say, listen, we think that this, this company would be a really add on uh, to, to what we are doing. And the rest is a story. Like we went through the, that, that process, choose them and did the due diligence and closed that uh, in 2023. So you closed in 2023. Did they have any, do you have any, like, what do they call it? What's the word I'm looking for? Uh, where they have to stay on for two, two years and work for them. Yeah. I read, well, I mean, they're, they're, they're like in, in, in the deal, like that was actually part of what we were, uh, looking for in a potential buyer, like, you know, a lot of people are focusing on like the money part of it, which is extremely important. Obviously you want to like a good deal that is win-win on both sides. But for us, another thing that was important and also like the kind of, uh, conditions that goes into the deal. So there was a retention, uh, you know, package that was put in place for like uh, me and my, uh, my co-founder, uh, we knew from the get-go that my co-founder would stay for the full two year and I would be, I was like the product COO uh, guy of uh, in that company. So I had to do a transition, a technical transition. And I did that um, for about six months and actually like uh, left from there to go start something else. And uh, I mean, most of the team is still there, very happy. So um, yeah, there was, there, there was definitely that, that part. One of the partner was also retiring. So the, the deal for us was making a lot of sense, again, not only financially, but also from a, you know, condition standpoint. Were there any conditions about you starting a competing business and not recruiting? Because, I mean, if you think about it, you're now back into AI and it, why would it be tempting to pull people that you've worked with before and you know their, your, their capabilities yeah. and, uh, you know, how to work with them? You're probably limited from pulling those people because you sold that company to, to KKR recruiting from yeah. them would be a bad idea. Absolutely. I think there's all of, all of these things are in place. There's obviously, as you can ex imagine, like legal contracts, there's reps and warranties, there's non-compete, non-solicitation clauses, and that's, that's normal. I mean, AI now isn't everything. So you cannot say to someone, do not go start another AI company because that would, that would literally mean like you cannot like start any new business in tech, but Certainly, like there was clauses about like, do not start like a company competing product in the labor market, like a data space, which is obviously not what I'm doing now. So totally uh, reasonable and, and expected to have these, these clauses in, in, in place. And yes, and on, on one side, like it limits you in terms of going to after some people that you had a lot of success with, but that's part of the game. And, uh, there's plenty of talent out there. So when I started my new business at the VC back one optionality, it was, uh, you know, it was a part of the challenge because my default would have been to go to the people that I knew, but it was also a great opportunity. So I've managed to assemble a team. I have like a great partners in that business as well, super CTO and, uh, you know, because of my, my past experience, again, like I like when you're having a bootstrap business. 
and you sell it, the cap table is clean, right? There's not a lot of uh, people on it. You basically, the use of proceeds of the transaction, they go uh, in your in your pocket after you pay your tax and uh, and debt and all of that good stuff. But, you know, th- th- that's the good part. Like the, the talking to VC-backed entrepreneurs who sold their business, sometimes they sell it. But by the time that all of the prep shares and all of the shareholders gets paid, there's much less into uh into their their pocket like people like to talk about vc mag business and these super stories but i think that again there's pros and cons and like uh vc money is is expensive but it, it costs you a lot of equity and the the sooner that you raise it the more equity you you leave on the table that that may be a negative aspect if i can say but obviously the positive is if you have like the right partner, the right VCs, and I certainly feel that Inovia is a tremendous partner for us. You know, you really have access not only to capital, but like to expertise and network to help you grow and, you know, invest in building something big. And based on my past experience, I felt that at some point, the fact that I wasn't having that growth capital and that backers and that part, those partners to help me grow was kind of like preventing me to achieve my desired outcome. So starting optionality, I thought like, you know what, I'm going to do it, you know, right, which I think I'm doing right, looking for the right partners from the get go and, and really go and, and solve a problem that I think is huge. I think that a lot of your audience are having the same questions that I used to have. There's a, there's a need to tool the advisors because our clients at Optionality are really like those advisors that, you know, are meeting with business owners and they need to rapidly give, like, get some alignment in terms of like, what's your desired outcome? Are you realistic also in terms of how much your business is worth? So when I'm talking to advisors, a lot of them are telling me that this notion of like, is the business owners ready? And is the business owner realistic about its option is enterprise value? It's a huge you know, thing. And they're wasting often a lot of time, you know, trying to solve, solve that or get some alignment on that. So that's why I decided to, to solve that problem and, and do it, you know, with the right VC back uh, partners. So for just a second, I want to delve into the tech side of this and for all of my tech listeners out there. And if you're non-tech, yeah, you might skip this portion. I don't know, but the nerd in me (laughs) wants to know, So both these AI tools, are you building them on the backbone of uh, the other models that are out there, the LLMs and the, like, uh, for, you know, for speed and expedition of development, are you building them off of stuff like, uh, you know, OpenAI's platform and their APIs or and Claude and all the other ones that are out there? Are you building off their platforms or did you guys go out and create something from scratch? Well, we're like, we're a pure play AI company. We're using AI across the board. So basically in, in, in optionality, what we are doing, for example, is that we are doing three main things in AI. And I'll try to be like technical and not too technical at the same time. So one thing that we're doing is semantic. So basically we're generating a pitch deck uh, for any company based on a URL. So you put like, any company URL, any company from one of your audience, or if you're an advisor and you have like 2,000 customers, you can plug in their website. We do a live search on that website. We build a pitch deck that would say, this is what they do. This is the market that they serve. This is the product that they have. And then what we do is that we, we basically take that, that text, if I can say, and, uh, and vectorize it. So we create like vectors of like, let's say like strings of, of text, if I, I want to simplify it. And we use that to generate comparables. Okay. So that's one thing that we're doing. So comparables of past transaction, similar to your business, which is very specific. Every business is specific. So the problem that we're solving with this AI semantic and vectorization is to find like good comparables of past transactions, the data set that we've built, and then, you know, public company comparables that are similar to you. Not perfect to compare a $5 million business with like a, you know, a publicly traded business. Although we have some like a small caps in there, but it's a, a good starting point. So that's one thing that we are doing. The other thing indeed that we are doing, uh, Ron, is we're basically back on large language models. So 
large language model. There's multiples, like there's four main ones. We're working currently with three of the of the big guys. So one is basically like open AI. So we're partner of like, we're part of the Microsoft startup program. Uh, the other one is basically Gemini from, from Google. So we're part of their startup program as well. And the third one is Coir. So Coir is an enterprise large language model and we're part of their startup program as well. So what we are doing, how we're doing large language model is that we're using these large language model to analyze text and generate text. What I mean by generating text is I can literally generate a executive summary, a uh, confidential information memorandum. So get SIM, a, a, te a teaser deck for that company based on the information that we, we basically accumulated. So that's the second, the second part of how we're using AI and, the, and I'm a, Hey, I guys, I can talk about it forever, but the third, the third part is basically using machine learning uh, algorithm and predictive models to predict the likelihood of a company to sell mm -hmm. and basically the future enterprise valuation of a company. So there's that notion of prediction that AI can help you out with. So that's the way that we are using AI right now. We, uh, there's, there's all kinds of other nuances and, and ways we're using it, but in a nutshell, uh, that's, that's what we're doing. It's interesting. You built it in my mind the same way. I would subscribe to all the tools out there that are available. And then I would do API calls to whatever tool is best at the task I needed, yeah. right? You know, open AI has been notoriously hor horrible at math. They're much better now than they originally were, but I'd never send a math call to that one. Right. But there's certain things it's it does really well. So it sounds like you did that. You have open, you, you can do open or you can do calls to whatever platform serves the task in your program the best needed. Absolutely. As we're doing the R&D, we're always testing out like where we get that, which model is giving us the best performance. Mm -hmm. And it's a never ending process because to your point, it's like a, it's a race. Like sometimes like, you know, career is it like, is really great for this. And then like that there's another one like for this. And same thing for us, we're always like improving, uh, improving on the accuracy of our models, but that's what I like to do. So, uh, that's why for, after an exit, I decided, you know what, like, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't start another one, like, because like you get tons of lessons from like the previous one and you know, it's inside of you. Like I'm a, like, I'm a repeat founder, I'm a repeat entrepreneur. That's I'm passionate about technology. So super thrilled about the problem that we're solving. So. You talked earlier about like the valuations being always trying to wonder what is my company truly worth? You're getting all these different pitches. I've had professors on here. I've had uh, people who teach ETA in like Stanford, you know, the Stanford lead for their ETA program, David Dodson. He was on here. And, uh, you know, some of these, I'm not, I won't quote which schools because I'll probably butcher it, but some of these, even these Ivy Leagues, and you ask them, how do you evaluate a company? They teach upwards to 147 different valuation models, right? So yeah. it, it, there is no, there, I, I would say there's no definitive science on how a company is to be evaluated or to be evaluated, sorry, not evaluate, to be valued. But there's a lot of things out there that seem to be, if you use this value, value tool, then the people you're trying to sell it to will understand why you did and, and you now they're going to do their own, right? It's like you yeah. got 147 standardized tools that people say that are out there. Then every PE firm, every buyer is going to have his own model, his own way that he does it. So I think some of these, I think they'll get you in the ballpark, right? Definitely. I mean, my approach to this one is a, a, a very important comment that you're making. You're like, I choose to build a solution for advisors because I believe that if you're thinking about selling your business or growing your business, you need to really reach out to advisors that have an expertise to take some of the data that we are generating and optionality and massage it and explain it and push it further. Our platform is really designed to have that initial enterprise value estimate. We're not talking like about like a full, you know, 49A valuation. We're not talking about like in Canada, like a CBV bad valuation. Au contraire, like if anything, like the platform will generate deal flow for the advisors to say, hey, this is the ballpark based on comps, based on a capitalized cash flow method, because we had access to your company financial and we know like what the, what is the industry whack and all of that great stuff. So we were able to provide an initial assessment. We were able to show you how do you benchmark versus similar businesses. We were able to tell you who are the acquirer in your industry. 
We were able to tell you how the enterprise value to revenue and EBITDA is trending in your industry for the comes that you've selected. Now what? What do you want to do? Is it like, is that number in, the, in those football fields that I provided to you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Entrepreneur, Mrs. Entrepreneur, is that what you had in mind? You thought that it was lower, higher, pretty much in the ballpark. What are you thinking about doing now? Do you want to sell now? Do you want to fix your business to sell it in the next 24 months? Do you want to build? Do you want to acquire and do that roll up? But at least now I have like data to have that conversation and figure it out what the business owner wants to do. And as an advisor, what can I do basically to help them depend independently of what is their desired, desired outcome? I can help you fix your business, get it ready to sell. I can help you sell it right now because this is what you want to do. And you have like, and again, there's a, this, this whole analogy of like the real price is what the market is willing to pay for your business. Right. And the only way to find out is to go to market. So this all like business valuation is to get like an initial assessment, a fair opinion of how much your business is worth and what are your options. So that's the way I've been trying to approach this. Like we really put it into the hands of experts that can take that data, massage it, and again, like, you know, talk about it with their customers because it's so important. You know, and you had a critical point there about working with advisors. Is an, another reason you should work with inv- advisors is, especially one that's knowledgeable in your industry, is every industry has different valuation models. There's different things. Some of them are drastically different. Okay. Like I buy newsletters occasionally, and newsletters don't follow any of the other models out yeah. there. They do. If you're buying a newsletter, you're basically paying 32 to 48 uh, times the trailing 12 month average uh, revenue, not, not EBITDA, not anything. And it's because if they're doing them right and you do your due diligence and make sure they're doing them right, they're running at 75, 80, 90% profit margin, (laughs) right? So you're, you're, you're paying for the last 32 to 48 months worth of of revenue. That's the only, and it's one of the only industries I've heard of doing that. Right. So have an advisor to know, your industry, how your industry values things and how to maximize that value. What is it? What are all the buyers looking for is absolutely critical. You're leaving so much on the table. If you don't have an expert uh, who understands your industry, take a look at your company. So I'm a big, I'm a big believer of that too. I'm also a big believer that that, that is much more prevalent and, and useful in the mid markets and the upper markets. Definitely. The problem in the low markets, the SBA loan type businesses, is a lot of those quote unquote advisors have no barrier to entry. There's no licensing exam or insufficient licensing exam. A lot of the a lot of people use brokers at that stage. A lot of the brokers in a lot of states, all you have to do to be a broker is print your name on a business card and call yourself a broker. There's no licensing so for whatsoever. Like as a matter of fact, I think there's less than two dozen states that require a license at all. Uh, it's low. Um, yeah. Maybe there's more now. I say not only like go go to the advisor, but make sure your advisor is vetted and has the experience you need. I hundred percent agree. We're focusing right now, Ron, on the lower mid market. So mm-hmm. might and and I have everybody has their own definition of what is that. But I would say like our platform is great for advisor that are servicing the five million dollar revenue to hundred million dollar revenue market. So that's right. really where. There's a lot of like, you know, there, there, there's a lot of businesses in that space. They're really, they're, they're, there's a lot of questions in the business in that space about like how much are, uh, their business is worth, but what are their options and what to do to maximize their value. And they're also very great business for PEs to get acquired by. So that, that space is where we decided to focus first. And I, I cannot stress enough that if you're a founder, if you're a business owner out there, and you're thinking about like, you know, maybe selling your business or growing your business that to your point, like to select a solid advisor that has a track record experience into your space that have been like, like helping businesses to your, your size, uh, and have done successful transactions is so, so important. Have access to tools and data to do their work properly and not just like, well, trust me. I've seen this and your businesses were that or no, like, I think that like, it's a serious process. 
The problem that I've seen in this market, Ron, is that the business owners are waiting way too long to have those conversations. They're waiting to the very last minute to have those conversations. So there's no, there's a lot of things that you should do to get your business ready, but also to maximize your enterprise value and optimize the chances for your business to be sold. There's also a lot of businesses that never get bought because they're not like sellable. So what I'm trying to solve here is like, can I create a collaboration platform where the business owner can be more proactive, but also the advisors, the advisors are also guilty. A lot of the advisors, a lot of your accounting firms or bankers are not mm -hmm. having those conversations with their business owners. And they just wait at the very last minute when a business owner says, well, we're going to go to market. We want to sell this business or we'll receive an offer from a PE or strategic buyer. And now I'm going to go and shop a broker or an iBanker, banker and I'm going to meet five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 of them. And then it's a beauty contest. And my thinking is that the advisors that are proactive, they're having those conversations proactively with the, 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 the business owners. Those are the ones that are winning. They're winning trust. They're creating value. They're having access to advisory and deal flow. So that, that whole idea of the concept of optionality is like, can we build a tool that would allow these two entities that are right now are disjointed, they're not proactive, they're not proactively collaborate to actually like change that and be more proactive in, the, in that process. That was like a big, big learning of mine when I sold my business before. Does your software look at that type of stuff too and say, look, you're, you're at this stage right now. And based off industry trends, if you can just get above this level, can you guys give indi indications to the advisor? Say, hey, if you can tell your client, <laughs> like they hang out and go on their certain their current trajectory they're on now, a 18 months from now, they'll be worth, you know, considerably more because they'll cross one of the industry thresholds. Yeah. Short, short answer is yes. Like this is all the whole part about like value creation and getting to, to your point. Like then I call it like the, the ladder, like the next the next kind of stage where like the multiples are different, that the buyers are also different. And also to tell you what, what is very critical for me is that, you know, you need to basically, you need to be in control, like optionality and having option as a founder. Often people are asking me around like, okay, so how do I maximize my enterprise value? And I can go like the financial answer and say like, work on like your bottom line. It's a multiple of EBIT done this and then the other, but my preferred answer now, which I'm very biased on that, but like I say optionality is maximizing your value. And that, not just optionality, my software, but optionality, having optionality, having options, having multiple potential buyer for your business. Those are partners, strategic partners, potential acquirers that you are regularly in touch with, that you're having discussion, that you're doing co-marketing with, that you're doing like product development with, that are using your products strategically, their key clients, that maximize your enterprise value. You know, the reason why I sold my last business was that I had like a sponsor that brought us in the corporate development of the PE. Like the, the days of knocking on doors of like PEs that you have like no relationship with, or even like large enterprise and say, hey, we have this cool tech or this nice product or that nice business and we want to sell it. I mean, it, it, it can work sometime, but like you're going to have like a much higher multiple if it's a relationship that you build over time. So, you know, all of, all of that goes to be proactive, start the process before take an advisor soon enough, like have a realistic understanding of like your enterprise work. Yes. You can say, Hey, if I went for the fences and I, I have like a home run, like maybe I'm going to get this, but realistically companies like mine with my pros and my cons and my strengths and my weakness, they're trending here. But more importantly, like, can I get to do these things to get there? And that's easier said than done. Like my personal story to be very candid is that we did a, that exercise and we tried to get from A to B and we were partially successful. And then it goes back to like one year, two years, three years later, as you've been through that value creation journey to say, okay, so we were partially successful. We managed to increase our enterprise value. We didn't manage to achieve the, this, like our, our full objective, but now what? Do we still have the desire to try again? Or now is the good timing to sell? The market is ready. We have built that optionality. And if you do all of these things, I think that you have a good chance to 
you know, exit. So that's my, to your podcast name, like that's my answer to how to exit. It's, it's to build optionality. It is brilliant to do that. I know a couple of founders who they're in the software space and one of them within the first eight months of him running his business, he started calling and talking to the people that he, in the long run, he thinks would be the, the acquirer, you know, the logical people to, rec- to acquire it. And he said, you should be surprised at how open they are to having those type of calls. Say, hey, look, I'm nowhere, his conversation was, I'm nowhere near ready to sell my company. But, you know, in the long run, I'd like to work with a company like yours. And, and here's what we're building. They build a re, you know, rapport early on with some of these, uh, you know, and he's calling the, I guess I'm calling them product owners or whatever. And some of these big, big corps, the Googles and stuff, somebody their job is to find products and to find companies to buy and stuff. And you just call them, say, here's what we're building. What do you guys need? Well, you know, do you need anything in our space? Is there anything that we, if we built it slightly different? And he's getting feedback from these guys and working with them early on and building a relationship. And the other thing he's doing. They said cl- cl- clients, clients and partners are yep. like big sources of like potential acquire for your business. And to your point, it can start by like a cold call or initiating a, you know, a relationship, but going to trade shows, like, and then just yep. going to trade shows and, but going to trade show with an agenda of like, Hey, having a conversation, how, how can we do more business together? How can we partner together on things? Not, not, let, let's not talk about acquisition. We're not there yet. Like we're, hey, how can we become like more strategic for you guys? Like how we can create more value. And if you do that with your key customers, your key suppliers, your key partners, there's a high chance that at some point they will say, hey, maybe there's something up here. And if you are the acquiree or the acquirer, like you can do the, the, the exact same thing with your, like your own supplier. And say maybe they they can become an acquisition target, so that's my that, that's the way I, I I look at it. So um, let's talk about where you guys are at in the optionality uh, phase. Uh, I know that you you funded it, you've grown this for a while. How long has it been around now? We basically like I started working on that like last year. I did mm-hmm. my pre seed round in February. We shipped a prototype in June to about fifty beta testers. Basically, private equity, accounting firms, i bankers, and commercial banks in the U.S. and Canada that have been testing the product, giving us some feedback. So we've been doing multiple iteration, and we're launching basically officially the product in September. So if there's people out there that are interested to get a demo, find out like what it does. Uh, happy to connect. If you're a business owner, you don't know where to start and you'd like to get like kind of an opinion on, you know, what a platform like Optionally can do, I can certainly like talk to you, share my experience. I'm happy to do that. So I, I'm sure you're going to circulate my contact info. People can find me in LinkedIn. But again, the product is really designed for advisors. So ultimately, if a business owner would reach out to me and say, hey, I want to go through a process, I would tell them like I can put you in touch with like some of our users that are using your platform to help businesses like yours. Just want to be clear on that. But yeah, we're we're at this stage where we're basically starting the commercialization of the of the solution. We have a huge roadmap, some really strong interests. So, uh, you know, I'm uh, again, like very bullish on what we're building. Awesome. And that, you know, September will come up behind us a lot faster than most people think, right? Like you blink and it's gone. It's like, we're sitting here right now and uh, July's gone. Like it's, it's August already and like, you know, it's like, where did the rest of the year go? But uh, September will roll upon us pretty quickly. Uh, if anybody wants to, especially all the advisors here, I've had, you know, this is show 238 or something like that by the time it comes out. A majority of the people have been on the show, I'd probably say 70% of it are in the advisory role. As much as I want to talk to operators like yourself on a regular basis, it's just notoriously yeah. harder to get on because they have all these requirements of what they can't talk about after an exit or that type of stuff. That said, if you if you guys are out there and you're hearing what we're talking about and you want to and you're one of the advisors and you want to work with him, now's the time, right? Cuz now they can get in and they can test stuff and they have you probably have a much limited more limited user base than you're going to have after launch. So they're going to get a little bit more attention, a little bit more, you know, interaction. Well, I mean, like, like I said, yeah, like I said, it's the, the right time also to come in. We're looking for like strategic partners that wants, that believes in what we're building. Ultimately, Optionality is a tool that will basically allow the advisors to 
be trusted advisor at scale. That's what we're doing. We're basically making them more efficient, you know, having more conversation because the, the, what we are doing right now, I mean, most of your advisors that are listening to the podcast are probably doing well, like all kinds of databases and data sets. And some of them that are larger might have like an analyst or someone who's preparing for that information. And it takes hours, you know, and if not days to do that. And at some point in the process, when the business owner is really like serious about like what they want to do next, what there's their desired outcome, you need to do that. You need to take it to the next level. But there's a lot of initial conversation that I think needs to be done like in a more efficient way. So that's sorry. That's what we are, uh, you know, uh, doing with optionality. We're allowing them to have like those conversation more efficiently uncover which one of their customers or potential customers are serious. Right now is the right right time. We're having conversation again, like with P's, investment bankers. We are having conversation with accounting firms, conversation with financial advisory, because like there's a lot of attention on like the next big wave of business transfer. As you know, that's probably why you're also in that space and how to accept this. So uh, it's, it's having a lot of success as a podcast. I mean, people are seeing that there's going to be a big business transfer wave. That could be a great opportunity for those who want to become proactive on, on, on capturing that opportunity, having proactive conversation. So anyways, I'm very happy to, to talk to people that believe in what we've been talking about today on that podcast, believes in that vision. And uh, if they want to take a sneak peek of what we're building, optionality.ai reach out to me. It will be my pleasure to, to do a quick demo and, and take you through the product. Okay. The uh, Real quick, I, th- I still have some questions here. The The biggest one is time savings, right? Uh, you, you talked yeah. about they might have analysts on. So we're talking, you know, or they might, they're doing all this research on their own. The one thing I've learned, and I play with AI, I mean, everything I, <laughs> I do around this podcast and the newsletters we write these days is all AI, AI enabled now. I, I wouldn't say yep. we use it 100%. We still go back and rewrite and stuff, put a human voice to it and stuff. A lot of times we just ask for outlines and, or, you know, but the research, I would say it, not only is it saved hours and hours and hours, we've actually probably quadrupled the amount of content we can put out because we can trust the AI well enough for the research to give us outlines on, okay, here's three articles and two data sources on this particular topic. We want to write an article based off of this. Give us an outline and some and some starter paragraphs or something uh, on what to do, and then it's basically in the creative space. It would be your muse, right? You, there's no more writer's block because it just you can say, "Oh, I don't like any of that." Give me another set, and it just almost instant, right? So, what is it? What does it look like for the analyst using the tool? How much time can they save? And then, have you done any analysis on time and money saved by plugging in? You know, what you've got created, what, what are the, what are they looking at gaining? What's in it for them? Yeah. Well, you know, good question. That's what we call it like an AI co-pilot. So optionality ultimately is your co-pilot because to your point, like you're, we're an enabler, we're an efficiency tool for the advisors to get them ready and prepared and have like more powerful strategic conversation with their clients. The first thing that we're saving when I was talking to analysts, because when you're starting a company and like any, any given state of the company, one of the most important thing for me is to talk to customers and talk to them like all the time and ask the right tough question, not only like the good stuff, but the good, the bad, and the ugly. And I was basically like, I, and I, I, when I, when you're building a tech startup from the ground up, like I'm doing right now, it's important to try to, and when you build your product roadmap to break it down in different sections and build something that solves a problem, a real problem that people are having. And what the analysts were telling me is that whether or not we want to do a business valuation for a client, we can do like a very sophisticated, like financial evaluation, but people, entrepreneurs, wants to see comps. They want to see like, okay, show me business like mine that sold in the past five years. Show me like, how do I compare all my gross margin is better or worse than like similar companies than mine. And what they were doing is that they were doing like traditional databases and looking for like web research and public companies. And it was a very inefficient 
process. So we're talking about like hours and how many hours run? Like it really depends like how many hours you want to put to it. But typically like it can be like five to 10 hours to get to a point where you're satisfied with the comes that you generated. So we can literally do that in minutes, like a few minutes. Again, like the power is building a company description and a, prop, a company pitch deck using the URL of that company. Yes, we have some limitation, like, you know, by the, the strength of that website and what has been published on that company. But typically, we have like way higher results to be able to surface companies that are very similar to that. So just that, what our users are telling us in their beta testing group is that like this is alone a one thing, a one feature that I could not now like live without. So that put aside, the other thing that we're doing with the platform in terms of time savings and hours that they're up, that we're saving is like driving insights about the industry, the competitive landscape, and uh, basically deal sector flow and activity and reason why companies are being purchased. So all of that data you can access to research, reading to press releases, analyzing an LS report, looking for sources, maybe putting something in chat GPT, but all of that is being built automatically inside of, you know, optionality. That's what, what's our like LLMs good at. It's mm -hmm. to read text, summarize text, and get some insights out of that text and formulate, formulate question that your advisors that are listening to the podcast, they can go in and ask smart questions to the business owners to get them think about what do they want to do next. So that's our, like, that's the initial feedback. Again, like I cannot really quantify it more than that because I would just making it up like and that, that kind of guy, but we're like, we're early, early on in our journey, but like tons of very positive feedback on how we're making the people that are preparing for those pitches, those initial meetings, those conversations way more efficient. It doesn't surprise me at all that the first thing that the analyst wanted or the advisors wanted was comps because you think about your average business seller, they've sold more houses than they ever sold businesses and they've been trained by brokers in the housing market that the way that houses are evaluated is what's going on in the market. And they're, you know, they bring, they're, they're real literal bringing it like a, here's three houses that sold that are similar to yours and look like yours and here's what mm. the market They've mirrored this off of that and right, wrong, or indifferent. That's what the sellers know, right? So that's what they're going to ask for. Yeah. I'm not positive that that's what they should have been asking for, but it, it works. It's, it, you know, the, the, any business is worth what the market will, will bear, what the market will pay. And that's how you see what the market will do. I think that the multi, multi, multiple approach is the way to go. And that's why inside of our platform, like, and I want to just stress that out for your, your, uh, your audience is that we also look at financial methods. So right now, what we've built is a capitalized cash flow analysis. We have yeah. the potential to basically do a discounted cash flow analysis and multiple other methods. Again, we don't want to be a business valuation tool. So if you're a professional and you say, Hey, I've seen software, I've seen people doing this. I've seen other, like, this is not what we are. We're a tool basically that allows you to have those conversations, provide an initial assessment, talk with about optionality, give options to your client, tell them how leverageable is their business, whether they want to raise debt to invest in their company, or if their strategic bar is going to do a leverage buyout, you know, business, like how leverageable is their business? Because for, for a lot of businesses at the SMB market, like, the price is largely driven by how leverageable is your business. Like that's how the company is going to get acquired. So just looking at comps without knowing like how leverageable was that other comp like means nothing. It's just like a matter of having that initial, are we in the same ballpark? Like, are you thinking that your business is worth $10 million and all of our football fields are telling us that you're probably more like a two to $3 million company. So I don't want to, dis so that's why we're, we, we, we build that business. Again, there was like that thing that we're seeing in the market that the earlier on that you can get like a realistic view of the enterprise valuation of a company and the options for that company, the better it is because then you still have time to fix your thing and improve things before going to market. So that's what I really, really wanted to tackle with optionality. I think you nailed that on the head there. I think the difference is, and I think, the reason I have hesitancy, hesitancy to say that the true comps model, like the real estate model works is it oversimplifies it, right? It's easy to say that this is a two-story house and this is a two-story house. 
and this has three bedrooms and this has three bedrooms. They're both in the same school zone. So that sold for this, your house will probably sell for that. That is a very simplistic model, very logical model. And businesses are they're living, breathing entities and their difference. And there's so many nuances from culture to the way the revenue is generated, to the way the contracts are written, to all the other stuff that what you just, you know, what you just described is more of an approach you have to look at is like, what are the options on the table? Because this isn't a house with three bedrooms, two beds, yeah. and, you know, two baths and a good school zone. This is a, an entity with a hundred beating hearts running it, you know, thousands of lines of code, cultures and human beings and emotions tied up into it, brand equity, all this stuff that a house doesn't have, right? Uh, you'll have way more options than that simplistic model that you've been trained in the broker world of, you know, of houses. So, And the advisors, the, the, the good advisors are good at explaining that. So that's why they need to be in the loop. Like we're not trying to replace the advisors. We're trying to basically like yeah. make them more efficient, have more conversation, yeah. have better conversation. And if they have more conversation, better conversation, my bet and my client's bet is that they're going to be the, the one winning getting more advisory mandate, getting basically more like M&A mandates. That's my bet. But you still need that advisor to explain to a, like most to your point, most business owner, like the transaction that they will do is the biggest transaction of their life. And they've never sold a business before and they don't know. And they get talk, like all kinds of things. They get like, oh, you have a two, two story house. I think your analogy, I love that housing analogy, but I also have a two story house. Yeah, but yours is in uh San Francisco and mine is in like uh, Tulsa. So two different markets and yours is 20 year old and mine is like two year old. And so you get the story, like you got to be able to compare Apple to Apple. You need to look at different methods. You need to look at what, and again, like ultimately, if you're selling to a financial buyer, this is typically not where you're getting the biggest, like the highest multiple, the best case are the companies that are building that optionality and that are selling to a strategic buyer. So that's what I want for business owner. I, I'm a business owner myself. I know like all the blood, sweat and tears that goes into building a business. And what I'm frustrated about is when I hear a business owner has been working all of his life, thinking that his business is worth X, gets disappointed because it gets like, it, it doesn't worth that much and he's not capable of selling it or he leaves tons of money on the table. While if you would have basically, or she would have like started three, four, five years before with an advisor, build an exit strategy, fix some of the biggest problem with his company, invest in some part of his business, then they could maximize the desired outcome. That's what I want to do with this. I love that you guys have thought about all this stuff. You have tools out there for advisors to help, help them identify these type of things and have these conversations. And that you're building something to to make the advisor's uh, job easier. And I'll, I'll be happy when all the advisors start giving me standardized sims and standardized uh, pitch decks because I can tell you out of the 100 or 200 I've looked at, many of them are not <laughs> quality and have missing data that I really need. I just had one recently or like, who is this guy sending me this? Because there's absolutely, it's a 40-page document and there's probably two sentences in the whole damn document that meant anything to me. You know, the guy was previously a real estate broker or something because it was all about the neighborhood the business was in and the crime rate and all this other stuff. And I was like, at this <laughs> stage in the game, I don't care, right? At this stage yeah. in the game, I need to know more about, you know, can it, can it do debt coverage? Or, you know, I'm going to finance it with some form of debt. Can it cover the debt? He had none of the financials in there that could tell me, you know, what the cash flow looked like. And, can, you know, I, I didn't know if it was bankable. Yeah, well, we have we have a module in the platform called Bankability. So you would yeah. be pleased with that, where we look at the debt service covered ratio and the debt to debt ratio and how bankable is the business and how leverageable is the business and how you can rebalance the short term to long term debt and all of that good stuff, which is, you know, a lot of like business owners, they're maybe less familiar with and uh, that it's eye opening for, for a lot of them. So definitely I agree with you on that. Well, awesome. I know I've used up a lot of your time today. Let's cover a couple of basics before we go. How do people reach out to you if they want to work with you and talk to you about something? And then how, how do people check out the tool, right? How do people check out is it optionality.ai? Optionality.ai, they can reach out to me on LinkedIn, Simon Leroux. Uh, that's my French Canadian. I'm sure that people have figured this out by now. I'm based in Montreal, Canada, but often in the US. 
So uh, can check me on, on LinkedIn or it's Simon, S-I-M-O-N at optionality with a Y at the end dot AI. That's the email address. So happy to uh, connect with, with folks. Anybody that has questions or wants to see that tool, just want to exchange some ideas on what we've discussed. I'm a pretty passionate guy about the, the problem that I'm solving and uh, about the whole like how to exit subject. So blessed that you, uh, you invited me on the podcast run and it was a pleasure to talk to you as well. Cool. Let's do now. Let's wrap this up with three takeaways. If somebody can only remember two or three things from the show today, what do you want them to remember of you, your tool, and basically exiting right out of a company? Great question. I, I'd say, uh, I would say that optionality is what gives you value. Like if you're in control, if you're in the driver's seat, if you have options, this is where like you're going to maximize your enterprise value. So that's one thing. Second thing is like be proactive about involving an advisor. So don't wait to the very last minute, even if you're not thinking about selling right now and you're like two, three, four, five years away, still talk to an advisor, have those conversations. And I would pick up one from you, Ron, like, you know, pick up an advisor that knows your space, have a track record in your industry and, and, and your company size as well. As you know, like uh, selling a $2 million revenue company is different than selling a $20 million one. So there's nothing wrong with that. Just like find out the right advisors. That would, those would be my, my three, three takeaways. Awesome. Well, thank you for being here today and hang out for a few minutes afterwards. Uh, we'll call that a show. I don't want to announce our new channel partners, the ITX Marketplace. Since 1998, ITX has created $5 billion in value by selling more than 225 IT businesses in 20 countries. ITX works exclusively with IT-enabled businesses generating between $5 million and $30 million who are ready to be sold and m and to decision makers who are ready to buy. For over 25 years, ITX has developed industry knowledge that helps determine whether a seller is a good fit for their buyers before making the match. ITX Mergers and Acquisition Marketplace, we have partnered with, has a proprietary database of 50,000 plus global buyers seeking IT service firms, managed service providers, Microsoft service providers, software as a service platforms, and channel partners with Microsoft Oracle, ServiceNow, and, self, and, and the Salesforce space. If you have an IT enabled business, you're ready to sell, I want you to visit the IT exchangenet.com slash marketplace how to exit that link will be in the show notes visit them now